We're trying to solve this system of linear differential equations. In the last video, we took the matrix of coefficients and we found its eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. Given this information, we can now find the general solution. We know that it's going to have the following form, some constant e to the first eigenvalue times t times the first eigenvector plus some constant e to the second eigenvalue times t times the second eigenvector plus some constant e to the third eigenvalue times t times the third eigenvector. But again, there's a little bit of a shortcut. This first piece has a real eigenvalue, and so there's not really much uh, going on there that we can change. We really need all the information. But for the second piece, something a bit more subtle is happening. Because our second eigenvector was complex and our matrix was real, that guarantees us that this piece on the right is just going to be the complex conjugate of the piece on the left. So what we saw in class is that a simpler way to, to simplify these, a way to get around doing some of the algebra, is to, to know that any constant times this bit plus any constant times this bit is equivalent to saying some constant times the real part of the left bit plus some other constant times the imaginary part of the left bit. And so instead of writing it this way, I'm going to write it that way, and that's going to save me a little bit of time in the long run. So I need to figure out what does this look like, what's its real bit, and what's its imaginary bit. So let's start by just writing it out. I have e to the lambda 2, which is i, times t, times x2, which is 1, 2, minus i e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So e to the i t is cosine t plus i times sine t. And this is a scalar. It's not a vector. It's just some function. And it's multiplied by the ve vector 1, 2, minus i. So if I push that all into my vector, for the top coordinate, I'm just multiplying by 1. So nothing changes. Cosine t plus i sine t. For the second vector, I double it. Sorry, for the second coordinate, I double it. 2 cosine t plus i times 2 sine t. And for the third coordinate, I multiply by minus i. So I get minus i times cosine t. Then when I multiply minus i and i sine t, minus i squared sine t is what I get. But i squared is negative 1. So what I get is just sine t. Now that I've done some simplification on this piece here, e to the lambda 2 t x 2, what I need to do is I need to separate out the real part from the imaginary part. And that just means I'm separating out the things with eyes and the things without eyes. So the things without eyes on the top, I have a cosine t plus i times sine t. So that takes care of the top. For the second row, I have 2 times cosine t plus i times 2 sine t. And for the third row, my sine t is the part without an i, and the i is multiplied by negative cosine of t. So this is my real part, and this is my imaginary part. So what do I have? I have c1 e to the lambda 1 x1 plus c2 times this real part here, cosine t, 2 cosine t, sine t, where c2 can be any constant, plus c3, where c3 can be any constant times the imaginary part, sine t, 2 sine t, and negative cosine t. Now a couple, a couple notes about getting rid of this i. 
First off, when I say the imaginary part, that vocabulary means I'm ignoring the I. I mean the thing that's times the I. So the thing I wrote down here really is the imaginary part. But second off, the C3 can be any constant. So if you're super worried about the I going away, just remember the I could be inside that C3. Okay, so we took care of our complex eigenvalues. We still had the real eigenvalue. The real eigenvalue, oops, there's a T here. The real eigenvalue was four and its corresponding eigenvector was 1, 1, 1. And if we wanted to put this all into one piece, it would look like this. This tells me what my first function of t has to look like what my second function of t has to look like and what my third function of t has to look like. And when you're interpreting these, c1, c2, and c3 can be anything, but they have to be consistent. So you can't have c1 be something in the first row and something different in the second row. It has to be the same all the way through. If we want to think a little bit about what this is going to look like, remember c1, c2, and c3, they're going to be different if we have different initial conditions. So it's our initial conditions that are causing uh, these C1s and C2s and C3s to take on different values. And certainly we could have initial conditions that cause some of them to be zero. So for instance, if C2 and C3 were both zero, then we would have a function that simply goes to infinity as t goes to infinity because these oscillating parts would go away. If we had C1 equals to zero, then we'd have a function that simply oscillates, just forever goes back, back and forth periodically. If we had both c1 and c2 or c3 non-zero, then we'd have a function that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but has a little bit of a wobble to it. 